that's the indie rock like gold standard it's like if you if you're if you're paying your bills and you don't own a car and you don't have to rent your place out when you're gone then you're like a professional musician welcome to critical thinking required hosted by lbw this podcast is intended for free thinkers entrepreneurs and knowledge seekers Join us as we discuss relevant financial topics, explore with guests their financial journeys, and engage with experts in industries such as space, media and entertainment, real estate, and many more. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required. You're with your hosts, myself, Tim Bickmore, and my two colleagues, Dan Weiss and Nathaniel Leach. And we have a guest with us today. We're very excited for this guest. Um, We have Drew Brown with us. So I'm actually going to read off Drew's bio because I'm going to give that its full credit that it's due and introduce him that way. So uh, here we go. So Drew Brown is a Grammy losing songwriter and recording artist originally from Broomfield, Colorado. He's a multi-instrumentalist and has been a member of the pop rock group One Republic since 2004. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife. Eden and his two dogs and two cats. Drew, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited to talk with you today. Uh, we wanted to bring you on. As you know, you know our, our podcast is called Critical Thinking Required. And one thing that we do love at LBW is business. And we really wanted to kind of get into the details of the entertainment business. And so we thought you'd be a wonderful guest to kind of share some of your thoughts there. So we're really excited to kind of start this off. But before we get there, uh, we really want to just have our audience get to know you a little bit better. So we have a few questions. I'm going to let Dan kick us off and uh, start into some of those questions, if you don't mind. All right. Well, thanks again, my friend, for joining us. We really appreciate you being here. And it's, uh, I think, I think Tim and I saw you about just over a year ago, uh, which is about the last time. We really did anything. What right? a care! So, uh, what a carefree time! It was. It was. It, I tell you, like COVID did not come up once in that in that <laughs> dinner. So, um, yeah. so we, we we miss those times and look forward to that again. Uh, but uh, glad wild. we get to see you in, in in this element. And by the way, too happy Hanukkah to you. Oh, same. Happy, happy Hanukkah, guys. Thank uh, you. It sure was great to kind of just bring us right into it, Drew. What got you into music? Uh, it's it's funny. I I don't. Th- I think obsession. I think just being a naturally inquisitive uh, kid that let had a like a a habit of obsessing over the things that he really liked. I think that music just became a really kind of endless endless arena that I could throw that interest into when I think more about the origins of starting to play music and starting to listen to music and kind of obsess over it I think if if the circumstances would have been a little bit different and it would have been like baseball cards or something I would have just kind of latched on to that maybe and and maybe moved on to something else when I exhausted everything that I could learn about baseball cards. But music was one of those things that it seemed like it went on in every direction, as far as you can see. I I remember the first handful of songs that I really, really loved. And I remember the first time I played a piano. And I, I remember the first time I saw an electric guitar in person and the first time I saw a drum set in person. And those were like those fundamental like guttural animal things that are like ah oh, ah oh, that i don't know what it is but it, that that's too that's too cool that that guitar or that like those drums are the coolest thing in the world what what is that and i and i don't care about anything else and i i think that a lot of You know, I think I think a lot of people that are lucky enough to do what they love kind of have a very complicated, hard to explain relationship with it like that. Or at least when I 
when I read the accounts of professional athletes or people that started businesses or inventors, it it's kind of all it's kind of a thread that runs through all of it is this obsession that you can't really understand, but you also can't really shut off. Like a natural pull, you would say. Yeah, just a very, you know, a a, a very guttural thing that is not a conscious thing that you're just kind of pulled towards it. Uh, Tim mentioned something to me the other the other week in talking. Um, we were actually talking about our business in, in this light, but it, it reminds your comments remind me of this. What we what we were what we were talking about how is how every single day. Um, it, you know, is some sort of, of battle. It's hard to see through every single day, right? But then when you look at it through a, a much larger uh, picture, a collection of days, uh, you have a completely different narrative and, and purpose. And I thought that was so enlightening that he brought that up in, the, in a conversation um, a week ago. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is I'm curious, you have this pull towards music and every day there's probably been pieces to that when you step back and take a look, are you able to describe what music means to you today? I think that's a really that's a really poignant question for for it being in a pandemic in 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 COVID. I think I might be able to say yes for the first time because it has been such a act like an, a real step back to kind of put things in perspective and take stock of all of it. I think, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe for the first time in this shutdown, that's been possible. I, I don't know. I hope, I, I, I hope that's one of the silver linings where we're, we're kind of always, you know, we're, we're always trying to make lists of the things that we are going to be more mindful of coming out of this. And I think what what the things that define so much of us are mean to us is definitely very high on that list. So I think I think I've got a little bit I think I've got a little bit clearer perspective now on what these on what those things mean than may, maybe ever before. I'm gonna try my hardest to hold on to that moving forward. It's my New Year's resolution. It's, that's good timing. And, and so we, we know that you play a number of instruments. You just talked a little bit about how, you know, you've had, had different draws to many different instruments. And of course, the, the two, I think that probably most people think of right off the bat are the, the keyboard and guitar for you. But uh, we, know, we know there are others. We know there's this thing called this glockenspiel. <laughs> I don't know what the F that is. So maybe, maybe you could talk about that. But is, you know what? Are there instruments that in, in general that you really, really love to play? Um, and are there any instruments that maybe you don't play that you, you'd like to learn? Oh man. Uh, I, so the, my, my main love, I love guitar. I love, it was a weird obsession as a child. The first time I saw one was in like a like an older brother's room that we weren't supposed to be in and like a neighbor's house and it was like you know it was forbidden it was the coolest thing in the world and uh that that was really the only thing that I was interested in I wanted to, I wanted to play guitar when I you know from a very young age um when I found out that there weren't guitars really in orchestras or you know or symphonic bands then I had really had no interest in it and uh that led me to kind of by default getting assigned to a choir class in sixth grade and the first day I walked in and I absolutely hated it and I thought this is awful I need to I need to get out I need to get into one of the music programs and so right next right next to that room was the band room and the first thing when you walk in the room right on like i guess doesn't matter happened to be to the left but there was this black drum set and it was the first time i saw a black drum set and i said oh my 
what's that what's this doing here and they were like oh that's for the jazz band and i said cool i'm i'm gonna be in the jazz band and I said, oh well you have to you actually have to like look no music and like be in a band class and I'm, okay cool sign up whatever and so they signed me up and i learned how to be a like multi-percussionist and i learned how to play marimba and xylophone and all those things that I never thought I would actually use professionally. And it turns out I use them professionally. I eventually started playing upright bass when I got into high school because I, uh, you know, I lost, I lost my interest in being a percussionist and I joined bands and taught myself how to play keyboard and, it's just kind of there 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 were more things to discover all of the time with music and i think that if if i didn't have if i didn't have that as a primary interest i would imagine that my interests would just kind of move from one to the other so i probably guitar still i never learned any woodwinds uh which would be incredible but i i don't know if I think that's actually something that you need to learn how to do when you're young. Along that journey, would you say that there have been artists or non-artists that have further inspired you? If so, who? I was really inspired uh, at a young age by a lot of artists that weren't really technically that proficient or good. My parents were really into like a lot of basically everything that was coming out of London and New York from like 77 to 82. So there was there was a lot of like, you know, early punk and kind of early new wave talking heads and the clash and XTC and, you know, bands like the Go-Go's that like it was the importance in the music wasn't necessarily i mean there's a, there there is genius in all of that but it's not like a flashy genius there's something intelligent and restrained or maybe even limited by the people making the music that kind of runs through all of that and i i think that i probably am more the way that I am because of that than if I would have grown up listening to Yes and or grown up listening to like really incredible bluegrass or something or any of the I know other musicians that are around my age that had you know influences that were way more technically proficient and it translates to them being way more technically proficient musicians but I would not consider myself those. And I think that a lot of my approach to art in general and just kind of the economy of the economical approach that I try to take with everything, I think was largely informed by a lot of the music that I was listening to when I was young. I was, I, I was, I was curious. So if your parents are you know, lovers of music coming out of that region and stuff, what was the reaction when you opened for like you two? They, my parents were, if you know, it, I feel like they play it pretty cool, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, they, they've, they've always been really, really, really proud and incredibly supportive. And I can't really wrap my head around what, how I would feel if if my child was you know off off doing like I I would probably be nervous if if my kid was in a different city than me you know I don't like I I give my parents a lot of credit for being as trusting as they are and as patient as as I I'm sure it, you have to be to have a child that is any type of artist 
I wouldn't wish it upon any parent. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite questions uh, for the evening. We actually talked about this in a podcast, two podcasts ago, uh, and, and the conversation came up about like, favorite concerts um, that we've ever attended as a you know, concert goer, right, in, in the audience. And so we talked, we talked a little bit about that. And uh, like, you know, for me, it's hard. I, I, my first concert was the Stones when I was like 13 or 14 wow. years old. Uh, I was, in, I mean, way to break it in. It was an incredible concert. Um, and I've, I've seen some great acts too. It was great. I mean, I really, you know, I, I, I went and saw the intention, which of course I did see them was to see the Chili Peppers, uh, which I've seen them a couple times, but I gotta tell you, and I loved what they did but um, the Foo Fighters opened for them and that's way up there for me too. The Foo Fighters just put on a phenomenal show. And then I've seen the opposite, which we talked about a little bit too, like Vanilla Ice. But nonetheless, um, you know, what, 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 tell us a little bit about maybe some of the favorite concerts that you've attended. Um, there, there, yeah, there, there are those, those kind of seminal things that really like stick with you that, that this is a this is a benchmark concert, and I I I got really lucky growing up in in Colorado in the Denver area that that's that's a place that everybody everybody plays and everybody you know everybody stops through. It's got a really great music scene. So I the one of the biggest I mean one of the biggest events of my life. I was ten years old and my dad took me to go see Weezer and teenage fan club and that dog in like 1994 and he threw me off of it wasn't like a big ledge it was you know like a slightly elevated plat you know platform he like pushed me into the mosh pit and i got my first experience in a mosh pit and i you know it kind of messed me up for life uh Fantastic. Uh, uh, gonna ask you this one off the top of your head. You gotta answer this, all right? Okay. So if you were to be invited to James Corden's carpool karaoke, assuming that you haven't been invited yet, right? If you were to be invited to that, okay. What song would you sing? And would it be the same song you sing in the shower? Ready, go. Oh man. Uh some pulp song. Uh probably something something really sleazy, I'd imagine. Something like that nobody would want to hear like i don't i don't know like disco 2000 or something or it, it would be like under the sea or kiss the girl from the little mermaid that would be out huh um funny well you know that it's so me and my wife have uh we've had a couple uber rides late night late night uber rides that have turned into disney sing-alongs with our driver um so yeah you're probably i'm trying to be cool but i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure you're way you're way more on the money you, We're know closer to it. Yeah. you know me better than i know myself look I, I i'd probably pay quite a bit to see you and eden singing uh singing with the the uber driver some disney <sighs> songs and i'd be very happy to join in with you thanks man it's almost always uh beauty and the beast uh, it's one of my favorites um, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. You can't. Uh, you can't break it. Yeah, yeah. You know when when guest down gets up there and just kind of hits that those notes, just fantastic. Um, big big <laughs> thumbs up from the peanut gallery over here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, I've, lots of fans here. This is uh, this is doing doing wonders for all of our credibility. Uh, just curious. Um, outside of the Uber car, right? What can you describe a bit the feeling, um, you know, of, you know, your first feeling of, of taking, taking the stage or your first feeling of taking a, a stage at a major venue and just, uh, you know, what, what that's like to get up in front of tens of thousands of people and play your heart. What does that feel like, Drew? It's so weird that is different for every for everybody like for for one person it's awful and for another person it's terrible i'm way more i'm more nervous playing for five people that that for me is terrifying 
Like the the scariest show I ever played was a birthday party in seventh grade. It was frightening. And every other show since then has been fine. I think the first time we opened up for U2 was terrifying. And I there were probably a couple other shows in there that we just didn't know what we were doing or we were playing something that we had forgotten. And that's that's you know that that's just fun. Those are those are the fun memorable ones. But yeah, there there is for me at least there is a weird there is a weird energy that comes out of a crowd that you can't see the end of that is the greatest thing in the world. It sounds like you almost just get in the zone. Like at that same at the same point, you just kind of get in the zone and it, you just get ready to go and become present in the moment almost in a sense you you have to focus you have to focus to be present in the moment but or in the moment because it is such it is a, such a weird zone to to fall into i i have to catch myself sometimes and make sure that i'm having fun like i need to i need to make sure that i acknowledge what's going on and i take note of how happy it's making me feel so I can remember that yeah that's that's very interesting to hear and I, I love the passion behind it too that's that's what gets me excited is your passion towards it um you know we, we've heard a, a lot and obviously um being an artist and a musician I'm curious for our audience what is something that people don't know about you when they when they get to know you what is what is that one thing they're like yeah this is this is a little bit more about Drew I'm a terribly irresponsible car owner. I <laughs> I am I washed my I washed a vehicle that I've owned for a couple years um for the first time in this pandemic. Um but actually I mean anybody anybody that actually knows me that that's that's one of my more defining characteristics. I think I was so close to being in a in a metal band, which probably would have turned out terrible <laughs> in the long run. I I quit I quit a I quit a, a metal band that I was supposed to go on tour with uh, to join One Republic, and that was a really really great call, and I'm I'm grateful for it every day. It, it, was that decision just kind of happenstance or, or I, I, I know you've mentioned a story to me about how you got in there, but was it just, they needed a guitarist, correct? And then you just kind of stepped in and said, sure, why not? I was, I, at the time I, I was living, I was living on my drummer's couch and he, he had joined a band in Los Angeles and it was a really big deal. We were, you know, we were coming from Colorado and like this, you know, this band didn't have, like, they were just starting, but they already had a manager, you know, and they had, like, they, they did a showcase, you know, and they, like, had a meeting. Like, all of these things that were, like, you know, th this is, like, we had we'd, we'd played, uh, you know, a, a hundred shows or maybe a couple hundred shows over the years in Colorado, but this was, like, light years ahead of that. So... I I happened to be on his couch when they needed somebody to fill in for their existing guitar player while he got married. And I learned this stuff. I think I, I had like two days to learn it before the show that I think was their like third show ever. And then we wrote a couple songs like... Uh, you know, the next week. And then I think, I think it was like, th there were like three weeks where I wasn't in the band. Um, but I was playing, I was filling in and playing, I think like four or five shows. And then in the, in the meantime, like, you know, there were a couple songs, like I, I wrote, I, you know, wrote some parts for a couple songs that were, that you know, were being worked on. And then maybe, yeah, like, Probably within a month, I think they they said, "Hey, you know, we we always wanted to be a five piece uh, 
do you want to call that metal band and <laughs> tell them that you can't go on tour with them this summer? So I called, I called that metal band and then I called my parents and I said, do you think you can send me some money? Hey, everybody needs to start somewhere, right? <laughs> At the end of the day. Yeah. And, and so if, if you, uh, if you didn't call the metal band, let's say you went with the metal band, where do you think you would be today? Do you think you'd still be with the metal band? Do you think so you'd be somewhere band, else? The metal band did not last forever. Um, I actually, I, I tapped my best friend in the world, Tyler, and he joined the metal band in my stay and he had a great time. And the tour uh, went pretty well. And, you know, I think everybody owns houses now and they're married and ha they have kids. So, you know, it, prob it probably would have been a, a pretty good life still had, nice. had, the, uh, had the metal band, metal band been, been the avenue. That's all. Hey, that's good to know, too. Regardless of what avenue you took, you're going to be a musician through and through, which is awesome to hear. That That's kind of... I never, the dream was always to be professional enough that you don't have to sublet your apartment while you're gone. And that, that, that's basic, that, that was basically, that's the indie rock, like gold standard It's like, if you, if you're, if you're paying your bills and you don't own a car and you don't have to rent your place out when you're gone. Then you're like a professional musician. So that's like, and I, I never really, that was never something that I thought was, I thought that that was reserved for like the luckiest people of, you know, in, in the entire world. And I didn't really, I thought maybe if I was lucky, but the plan was always to just play music in the capacity that I had been playing music before I moved to, LA, which you know was a few get a few gigs a week or a few gigs a month for a couple hundred people. It's really, I would have been happy doing that forever and working any menial job. I, have you ever thought about this? If you had decided to stay with the metal band, would you have still met your wife? Oh man. That is ah. such a that's such a strong such a strong question. The <laughs> I I met my wife in the most faded, weird, crazy, star-crossed way that there's there's no way there's there's not a chance. Um, it's it's actually it. I think just meeting my wife alone and the weird circumstance that led to us meeting each other made me uh, like an unbearable fatalist. <laughs> uh, maybe not for life, but definitely for a really long time. Um, and I, I was, I was coming back from a long tour. Uh, I was, I was flying back from Asia and my last flight was it was like the fourth flight in like a 24 hour travel block and it was from san francisco to la and it was canceled and so i jumped on the next flight to la from san francisco and i sat next to this girl who talked the whole time and she was like you know she was very she was forward she was you know, determined and she was bold. Um, and we exchanged information and then like fast forward however many months, I I got a message from her and she said, hey, do you want to have coffee with me and my college roommate around the corner from your house? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I'm actually leaving tomorrow for six months. This is great. And so I went and had coffee with the girl and the roommate ended up being my wife. So it's yes. the, the late. I la love those the, stories. The layers of misconnections, like of sliding windows or whatever that that it took to actually get to that point, 
is like it none of it works without me being on tour and being like i don't know all like all this i'm i don't have a single regret but i also really love my life so yeah. that's a what a great nice. thing a great question by the way um and that's a great story too that is that is a wonderful way to meet your wife that's 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 awesome um uh, i'm proud of myself for not having told you that already <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't remember I that one. I, remember, I should have. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, that's, that's that's my yeah, it's my greatest hit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I you know there there so for our audience, which we're, we're after this, I'm gonna let Nathaniel kind of take over, and he's gonna ask you some more of the industry kind of based questions, more about uh, just entertainment in general. But before we get there. I know probably a lot of people don't know this, um, but you had mentioned it to us and, and we had a conversation about it, that you're a partner in a brewery in Colorado. So you, oh, yeah. you're, you're multidimensional when it comes to entrepreneurship, musician, as well as a uh, brewery. So why start a brewery, man? Like, and how is a brewery doing during COVID? Like just why did you start it and how's it currently doing? Oh man, it's currently, currently doing, we are doing, as the i think the best that we could be in covid um we just actually this past weekend we celebrated our eighth anniversary congratulations thank big you de- getting over the five-year hump's a big deal so eight's great thank thank you it's really it's been it's been interesting i think that i think that the only credit that we can take to to our ability to make it through this is the way that we kind of structured everything in the beginning. Like our, our business plan with our brewery was our business. Basically when we started our brewery, we started, we started it knowing or kind of having a feeling that there at some point was going to be, some type of a bubble burst on that industry. It was growing really fast. The, we, at the time that we started eight years ago, there were in, independents being purchased for, you know, large nine figure sums. And it was, it, it was, it was a business that a lot of people were getting into for the business part of it. We, we knew that if we wanted to be the kind of brewery that, was doing things our way and kind of furthering the craft side of it, we were going to have to be really, really, really scrappy. And we were going to have to kind of run our business like you would run a DIY punk band or, you know, like the, it was all of these things that we kind of took from our, you know, our, our youth of playing in these bands and, doing doing everything ourselves i think really paid off in the pandemic because we've always been ready for everything to fall apart and the when we see we see other breweries and restaurants with these you know these huge notes and these really expensive build outs and you know maybe they have distri- distribution through partners that need huge amounts of beer every month and they just kind of need to be big to exist the only thing that we have going for us is we are stuck being very small and so because of that we you know we 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 don't have as much to lose in times like this and that's kind of been it's been interesting because there there are a lot of parallels between any type of niche like craft business and the the process of building a brand like a band there's there are a lot of similarities that one kind of informs the other and in the same way that we are a little bit more nimble because of our size being the brewery that we are it's we we're we're able to roll with the punches in this pandemic a little bit better than the big guys and that's that's kind of you know it's the same it's the same deal in music i i know some 
everybody I know is taking a huge hit this year, but the people that have been doing all of their own stuff for, you know, for forever and have a really tight ship, they're, they're definitely able to recover a lot better. Well said, very well said. So I'm just going to get in a few questions here, Drew. Uh, I hope they're going to be as good as my last, but I, I don't think I, when it comes to talking about your loved one, I don't think there is any other better story, <laughs> honestly. I feel the same Wait, about my well, wife. I was going to say, that's great, man. It, yeah, I, uh, only, only lucky people get to feel that way. Amen. Very true. Uh, so how... For those aspiring musicians out there, uh, can you perhaps tell them about how did you go about positioning yourself to become the musician and entrepreneur you are today? Uh, you, you've kind of touched on this, I think, a little bit where you you're, you saw music as, as endless. I. I can relate in, and I think that all of us can relate in what we do and that there's so many different facets to what, what we do, that there is no end in sight. There's, we're always learning. Yeah. So you, you've kind of touched on that, but was there any, um, did you have a direct, uh, something in mind? Did you have something in sight? Did you have a goal in mind that you were taking deliberate steps towards, or was it more of like a, a Lollapalooza uh, a, a, a snowballing of events that all of a sudden things just clicked and you joined one Republic and you continued as you are today. The, the theme of one Republic as a band, I think is a very distinct combination of those two things. It for, for all of us, it's kind of been a process of having incredible things happen and incredible things go away and incredible things happen again. And, you know, incredible things go away. Lots of work, uh, going to waste, lots of work, you know, uh, creating favorable results and kind of everything in between. It's been, I think one thing that we've learned in our career is and and I would I would say as as far as expectations for other other people entering a creative field it's the only the only way to play and not just kind of depend on luck is to expect expect failure and expect that you're going to have to kind of reinvest and re like, you know, re restart a lot. You're going to have to, you're going to have to kind of take these leaps of faith in yourself and you're going to have to do it over and over again. There, I don't think that there has been a single, a single event maybe since the like nuclear uh, explosion of our first single that has really changed everything for our band. It's always been the outcome of a lot of different decisions that were labored over by a committee of people that don't always, you know, eventually all see eye to eye, but that, you know, definitely it takes, it takes a village of, of people making so many good decisions in a row to not lose your footing or i mean you're going to lose your footing all of the time but to just kind of keep trying to move forward and that's that that's the that's the one thing i mean there are a lot of lessons that i've learned in music that we've kind of see applicable in other businesses but that those those principles of reinvesting like believe you know re reinvesting yourself starting over exploring changing changing approaches when they don't work looking for new approaches going back to approaches after the new approach hasn't worked like all all of these things 
it's it's really kind of the only way to to keep to keep a business afloat when all of the framing of that business is constantly changing like it is in music is all about not being partial to your approach because it's i mean when we started when, when we started this band it was still kind of at the tail end of the heyday of you know actual like physical music sales i think when we we signed I think I think that there there were still you know there were still records that were there were a lot of records that were selling millions of copies in 2004, you know 2005 it was significantly less and every year it was significantly less and now if you have an outlier like a Taylor Swift or an Adele, that's that record that single record that sells 8 million copies or whatever whatever is probably going to carry the entire budget of an entire label for a year or two and what's interesting too drew that you're kind of explaining that what i would call the day-to-day -day grind and the evolution too which you, you said very very uh, succinctly and nicely um you know there's a book called good to great which is a great book and and in that book the author speaks about a big wheel and he talks about how every great business or, you know, every good business that turns to great, they just push that big wheel and they push it a million times and still it starts just turning on its own. But if you were to ask that person, what was the one push that did it? They would have no idea, right? It's just that it's, it's a daily grind. And that's when you speak of that, that's what it reminds me of. Cause you know, for our business, I would, I would say, I feel the same thing. And it's, it's interesting to hear musicians going through, the same process as maybe Facebook, Google, you know, and any other type of a brewery, you know, it's, it, it, it's really, yeah, it's, I, I think it's kind of universal. I mean, maybe not if you're working in, you know, I like auto body repair, like there's probably things that are changing at less, uh, you know, a less like, uh, a, a less extreme clip, but with music, it's, I, I remember, I remember signing a record deal maybe two or th two years after our first record deal. And the landscape was, had changed drastically in two years. And I mean, I, that, that was, that was, a long time ago so it's i'm what 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 the music business looks like now it barely resembles what the music business looked like even just 15 years ago and it's been it's been a lot of lessons learned but also i think i think that we've we we got really lucky as, as a group that we started when we did and i think that had we started a little bit earlier and been a little bit more attached to the business plan that had been in place for decades at that point, I think it, it would be mentally a lot harder to, to be as nimble as it's taken to kind of roll with the punches in the last 15 years. Very interesting. So you, you've already touched on this a little bit, but is there, can you go into maybe more detail about uh, what in the music industry has significantly changed that has significantly affected you and One Republic? Is there any particular, or is it more, as you say, uh, a, a spargus board of, of things that have all aggregated together and, and affected you and, and everybody in the industry? I think there, there's a lot of, you could probably point to maybe like four or five key factors that have really affected all of the industry. Um, and, you know, to, to a certain extent, they've, they've affected One Republic, but I think that there, there's a handful of, there's a handful of things that have kind of had trickle down effects in, in the worst ways in my industry. And 
it's usually the responses. Uh, it's usually the business response by the people that have the most to lose that kind of cripples things the most for the artist. So, for example, when we first started doing radio promo in 2006, yeah, 2006, uh, we were back then, you, you know, you would go, you'd go visit the radio station and you would shake hands and, and you would meet the program director. And, and, and if it was, if, if, if they, if, if they were interested enough, it would be like an actual sit down. You'd like play them some songs with your label rep in the room and, you know, and it, it wasn't nearly as cool as the, you know, like, CD, CD, like jewel case full of Coke days, but like there was still, there was still a transactional nature to marketing. Uh, when, when we started doing this at a, you know, at a professional level and over the years, over the years as the, you know, as the bottom line kind of started to change for these companies and the, terrestrial radio company radio owners kind of started getting bought up and you know now i think we have two two or three companies that own terrestrial radio in america but i i think it's it it's been it's been these things that have kind of had this this sweeping change in the industry and one of one of them was doing away with uh doing away with radio programming to the extent that they had it for the longest time they used to add they used to have four ad dates a month uh for terrestrial radio where they would add new songs to the playlist and then about 10 years ago that dropped to two a month and then a few years after that it was one day a month that they would add new songs to the rotation of what you'd hear on the radio so it it sounds like a really small thing but it from the label perspective that's that's one quarter of the songs that you're actually going to get people to listen to so that's a quarter of the records that you are expecting a quarter of the different albums that you're expecting people to kind of be aware of which means that you're only going to sign the Lady Gagas that really could make a difference for the label. And all like that basically that that was that was the thing that kind of put the nail in the coffin in my opinion as to the long-term viability of terrestrial radio because now we're 15 years into this and None of the charts, uh, none, all of the charts are now driven by streaming numbers. So you can kind, you can be a record label and you can sign an act that you really believe in, and you can go to all of the, all of the record. You know, you can go to all the radio stations and shake all of the hands, and they can play it all of the time. But if people aren't streaming it, then it actually is not making money. And if people aren't streaming it, then it's not going to end up in a chart, which is how you end up with charts that are changing a couple times a day. It's pretty, it's wild. The whole thing is like, it. it's so fast moving that I would say it's equal parts frustrating and exciting. That is absolutely fascinating. It's these kind of little things for people like us who are outside of the industry that we have no comprehension of that can change our mindset completely. It just blows my mind. But like, like, like you guys said, you know, none of none of this really. This is another one of those things that makes only makes sense when you're kind of looking back on it, and you can kind exactly. of you can draw the line through the the decision making that goes from one situation to the next at the time we didn't realize that the same amount of hours that we were spending on the promo trail were getting us less results because like we just assumed 
it was one of any number of things and not necessarily that it was an industry that was fundamentally changing while we were trying to tackle it. Incredible. Well, I, I just have one last question for you for, for my part. What would you say is the most important thing to remember or do when working with your fellow band members? It's, it's really, communication is incredibly important and open-mindedness is, is a, that's, that is equally as important. I would say that the thing that I struggle with the most in collaboration is being more patient and being more open-minded. I think it's very, it's, just like anything, any other discipline, it is, it's really easy to kind of fall into the, th into the rules that you have for yourself. And, you know, in the, in the same way that if you're writing for a newspaper, you kind of have, you know, you've got their specific like style, you've got, you've got their, their, their style book memorized. And if you have been, if you've approached arranging a song uh, from a certain perspective your whole life, then that's kind of, you know, that's, you need to, you need to recognize what your bias is in a creative partnership. So you can try to keep that from just running amok and ruining everything. I think that for me, at least creatively, that is, that's, that's been, a a realization that I've grown into that I really wish I would have grown into as like a young man. I, I think I probably would be, I, I, I would have been more productive. That's so interesting for you to say the biases that you create from a creative standpoint. I mean, Nathaniel is, I think our bias champion um, inside the firm where he always talks about having the lenses and making sure that our biases don't uh, affect our decision-making within our business and, and how we're treating our clientele and the services that we provide. So to hear it coming from you, from a communication with your band members and being more open-minded, I mean, that's just a great way to say that's great leadership, you know, and in a lot of ways, um, which I appreciate that. Um, you know, and, and, and the question that I have more from a business-related standpoint and I, it's, it's always interesting to be very honest with you. I, I always wanted to be an artist myself, but specifically more in the drawing area, but I was just never really good at it. It was never my thing. Um, I happen to be better at numbers and, and different, different analytical skill sets. But I always tell people that I feel like my creative juices and that fulfillment comes from business. I think that business is a blank canvas that you're able to create a, a platform or create a structure and it's never ending. It's always open-ended and it's that thirst for knowledge and getting better and providing a different service, which really provides that fulfillment from an artistic standpoint for me specifically, um, which goes back into the craft, right? I think you, like you've mentioned, you are a guitarist, you're a musician, you have a craft. And there's another book that I like to always reference called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. And he talks about the three personalities of a business owner. And he always talks about how there's the entrepreneur who's very visionary, the manager who has to manage the entrepreneur. And then there's the technician, the person that's really good at the task. And typically speaking with an entrepreneur or like yourself, a musician, it's usually you're really good at a craft and then you make it into a business. So how have you dealt with that creative side, that artistic drive, and then balancing that with the business side where you may have to make decisions that your artistic side may not like, but it's gonna make you money. How has that been in throughout your career? That's such a great question. And 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 a really a really fun a really fun number of directions to take it. Uh, I think I think that over I would definitely say that personally I would fall into the camp of a person that was a creator that was kind of forced to be a businessman. Um, and I would say that there, there is 
the cool thing about music, and I would say any type of startup, I, I would throw our brewery in the same column, is there, there's creativity. There's a lot of creativity in, in the flexibility of the business end of it. And that, that to me over the years has been, I think, as fulfilling as the, cre- as the creative, as the creative actually in the output is kind of the fact that there is, I mean, you guys know, the, it's such a complicated alchemy to make any business succeed or even sustain. And every single, every single thing that goes into that business is a bunch of decisions. And I think, I think that the, like we were saying, the the always moving nature of the business that we decided to get into meant that we had to stay really creative with our approach. And I think having that creative element to conducting business business as a band has been, it's kept us more engaged and it's kept us more interested. I When I think about when I think about the decisions that we make as employers and, you know, just as in philanthropy, that's the, those are, those are the types of, those are the types of business components that actually define the type of business person that you are and the type of business that you're running. And so the decisions that you get to make with, your employees and with your charities like that's the type of that's the type of stuff that you can actually be more proud of than a song you know or like something something that you that was the original like the music is the original like purpose for the business but when the business can do things that are also fulfilling and also important then then that's that's great that's that that means that the business exists for a reason and i think i think that that's been that's been the biggest surprise i think coming coming into this thing not as a business person kind of turning reluctantly into a business person then becoming a little bit more informed involved and mindful as a business person and a business owner has been a uh, like a really great silver lining. That, that's a wonderful answer. And uh, sometimes the, the person I like to quote the most, I think in the entertainment world is LeBron James. And, you know, he, in an interview, he once said that basketball is my sole focus because basketball lets me do everything else. So I will put all that's my effort quote. And, and energy into basketball because then I can do all these other things and basketball is not my life right? It's a platform that provides for other things. And I think that uh, that's a really good way of approaching business is it is a platform and it can evolve and it can change. And if you're not willing to, it may run you over. <laughs> it just may. Yeah. Back and, to the, back to the big wheel. Imagery. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's, it's a really good question. I mean, it's a really good answer that you said. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, you know, my last question for you, Drew, and this really comes from more of an, again, the industry perspective and things that have changed. How has streaming affected One Republic, the industry? Is it for the benefit? Is it for the detriment? You know, is there, is it, are these platforms allowing other artists to be able to be seen more? You know, I've heard that there's an opposite effect where you only really hear 1% of, of musicians on, let's say, Spotify. You know, how, how do you feel streaming has positively or negatively affected the industry? What so I I think it's that's a great question. Um, I think it's hard. I think to to really analyze the effect, you kind of have to throw all like throw throw it all 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 down on the table. And there's there's a lot of good, you know. And there's 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 some drawbacks. Sometimes the drawbacks outweigh the benefit. Um. And then the argument can also be made about some of the drawbacks being inevitable and not related to changes made by streaming. Um, I think I think that it's really great. It's a really great way to level the playing field. 
And as somebody in a very unique position of being in a like successful pop band that it works often enough that that can be my only job. If, if that was, if that, if, if I wanted to, that could be my only thing. And, and that's a very rare thing to be able to say anymore. Um, that being said, I have always really championed independent music and feel more i most m- most of my favorite music is made by people that make less than teachers and and that's so for me i think that the opportunity afforded by streaming to kind of level the playing field for everybody is incredible in theory i think that the the degree that w- the degree to which streaming has replaced conventional music sales makes it really hard for anybody to really make money i think the when you say that the top 1% you know people are hearing 1% of of the music that's out there and you know people will argue about the you know the 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 gatekeepers of yesterday that were the labels and the, you know, the program directors at the radio station. Now they're just the people that work for Spotify that curate the playlists. And there's, you know, there's, there, there are always going to be gatekeepers. There are always going to be tastemakers. I think what streaming has done is it's accelerated the downfall of the monoculture that we all grew up in. And I think that for, for people of a generation older than the generation that grew up online, it, it's drastically different to open up an app and see 10,000 new records that came out that day. Like that's mind boggling. We have, we, it's to us, it's alienating because we grew up with, Casey Kasem and TRL and you know like the back of Rolling Stone and like there there were these things that like it was music was not conquerable but it, music was something that you could speak on with the authority of somebody that knew sports like that that was that was a thing that absolutely is not a thing anymore there streaming has leveled everything to the point that there are you know there are hundreds of thousands of new songs every week from all over the world so it's just kind of is it good is it bad it's both it's but like i think that the people at the top don't deserve that much you know and, and if 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 i if if i'm lucky enough to be in that you know in that category then then that's great but i it, I, I don't I don't think that you know I don't think that anybody should be making Madonna money. You know the the whole, only thing maybe that is actually uh, uh, a constant may, might actually be change in in this time of COVID. What what do you what do you think? I mean, obviously there's been a lot of changes. What do you think might be a lasting impact from the fan experience and from the performers' experience? looking now into the lens of COVID? It's hard to say. I think that I think that when everything goes back to normal, and I don't mean like, you know, five days after the vaccine comes out. I mean, like when things are actually, when people are less, are less likely to fight with each other online when they see a photo of somebody at a birthday party, like that when when we're that level of like back to normal um which might i don't know might might take a couple of years for like the the trauma of all of this to wash out of more than half of the people i don't like when when that happens i don't really know i think that the the business the business end of this industry is going to be more affected than the fans are i think that I think there were a lot of 
there were a lot of aspects of the industry that were kind of, you know, they were, they were barely alive from a different era. And I think that this, like, this is really going to change a lot of things. I think that this is kind of, it's going to be the death knell for a few old institutions. And I really hope that it's not that we figure out a way to bring back independent music venues. Cause that's the, that's the thing that breaks my heart more than anything, honestly. Cause that's with that. If you take that step out, then I don't know. I don't know what music looks like in 10 years or 20 years. Like if you don't have, if the only way that you if the only shot that you have is like through your bedroom onto SoundCloud or Spotify, and there isn't that step in the middle where you're writing songs and you're going out and you're playing for people, that's, man, that's such an important part of so much of the most important music. And that, that's the thing that, that's the thing that has me the most concerned is what, what are, what's the effect of, of, all of these kids that otherwise would be starting the best bands, like starting the bands that are making the most important music 10 years from now, like, is it just not going to happen because there's no point to start a band? There's no place to play like that. Those are the things that concern me the most, uh, more so than my, than my career. I like, I feel very lucky that, you know, I was able to have a music career of any sort. Like I, I'm, I'm way more concerned about the future of the viability of people being able to have music, music careers. And so hopefully whatever comes out of this, whatever changes are going to have to happen to keep the various parts of the music industry that are hurting so much right now afloat. I hope I hope that the changes they make are more future proofed than the changes they've been trying to make over the last 15 years, because it's kind of, I think we're in the position that we are now because it's just been bandage after bandage after bandage and not really rethinking, not, not really rethinking the business model, the way that you have to as a band or the way that you have to as a, you know, a DIY artist or, a brewery or you know somebody that makes wallets on etsy like they're through that is some just really insightful perspective there thank you so much for that we um we uh we're running running out of time here so we'll we'll, we'll wrap up this really excellent interview thank you again for joining us today and thank, uh, thank you guys I mean, it was our, it was our pleasure, Drew. And it's just, it's so nice to see you. And I, I, you know, I, I, the one thing I know that we really didn't touch on it. We just want to thank you for is, um, uh, is just also Tim mentioned it with his wonderful Iran comment. Um, you, you and Eden give so much to the community and that that's how we met you. And, um, it's just, uh, it's just very impressive. Um, I know that she's doing some writing right now. What is, what is that she writes called was a wider lens? So uh, my wife Eden has a it's it's a Jewish world news newsletter that comes out twice a week, and it basically it is it's 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 a it's a way to kind of catch up and get the context for all of the things that are constantly changing um, in Israel and. America, across the world, basically any any part of the diaspora is fair game for a wider frame. Wider frame. Uh, a wider frame. And wider frame. you can go and sign up on a widerframe.com. And yeah, I I'm incredibly proud of her. If I if I could do if I could do anything as meaningful as what she does, I probably wouldn't be wasting my time playing music. Well, I don't, uh, you know, as, as a closing thought, I don't know that I would, I would say a, a waste of time, Drew. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I think that where words, where words fail, music speaks. And we really appreciate 
your contributions, um, you know, to, to the music industry, to the community, um, you know, to friendships. It's it just, uh, we're just very thankful for your involvement in, in this life. Um, you know, and I, and my, I guess my last thought too, just pulling, pulling from the, from the conversation is don't, don't underestimate a number of things at the top of that list. Um, don't estimate, uh, underestimate the, the power in, in taking a leap in faith and don't estimate, uh, estimate don't underestimate the uh, partner that you pick in life because your spouse is very instrumental in your success and, and happiness. Amen. That is, um, that is the strongest message. That, that Dan always, I always have to follow Dan up on my final thoughts and it's always a bummer because he's so good at his final thoughts, but you know, Drew, I want to thank you again for obviously joining us and we really appreciate your time. And, and what I, I really honestly appreciate is the passion that you have for your craft. And I think you said that at the very beginning that it becomes an exception of obsession or a passion and, and it's true. And it, and it comes through just you talking about it and how much you care about the industry and not even just what you're doing, but what, how others are can come up and come through, you know, the different routes. And that's just really, really comforting and nice to hear you speak to it at that level. Um, and so I really do appreciate that. And the other thing too, that I just really appreciate is that even though you're a musician, it's so fascinating to hear that you go through the same trials and tribulations as we do being finance guys. And I think that some people just sometimes think that business isn't universal. And I think it's universal on a lot of levels from music to art, to tech, to even philanthropy to that level, right? That there's a lot of organization, there's a lot of structure and there's a lot of hard work that goes into what you're doing. And so I always like to tell people that if you wanna be an entrepreneur of any kind, you better be ready to grind and you better be ready to grind long enough to make it. So <laughs> um, I appreciate right. all your thoughts and, and your passion behind your craft, so thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna keep mine short and sweet. I, I just wanted to say, Drew, that I appreciate your humbleness, your, your sense of humor, and what is clearly a high level of emotional quotient. I, I love the story about meeting your wife. As I mentioned, I too have a, uh, one of those stories about how you meet your wife. It's like one in a billion. I know that feeling and I appreciate it. I really appreciate how much work you put into to where you to get where you are today and how much you clearly work to go where you want to go in the future so i, I thank you for being on our podcast it was really a true pleasure having you you guys thank you so much those uh i'm not deserving of any of those compliments from you uh you were too sweet and i'm going to try to remember all of those things that you said about me the next time i feel like a total fraud but no thank thank you so much this has really been it's been a strange time for everybody and i think that you know in regards to business and the creativity that comes that comes along with with running a business and and just being obsessed with business as, as, as you, as you put it, like that's, that this is a really trying time for, for those, for those cares because business is deeply affected by everything that's going on right now. And I think, I, th I think that, I think that people that find the joy in the challenges of change and of the create the creative ways that you can approach business differently are going to actually come out of this pandemic a little bit stronger and a little bit a little bit less jolted maybe than those that kind of are not as passionate about what they do and about doing what they do in the best way and i think that that's i'm I'm really looking forward to the new things that are going to come out of all of this. I, th I think that 
everybody in the world that makes it through this situation that we're in is going to be a lot more resilient than most of us were a year ago. And I've got a lot of faith in what's going to come out of that. Very well said. And one, one, one last thank you, Drew. Just thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to our audience for taking time out of your evening to think, thinking to, for taking time out of your evening to think critically with the three of us and Drew. Have a great night and happy holidays. Thank you for taking the time to start your journey of thinking differently and listening to LBW talk about stuff they love. Until next time.